Hello. Welcome to module 10. Further analysis of financial statements. As I told you in the previous module, we'll be analyzing companies on the basis of profitability, liquidity, and solvency. In this module, we'll be doing the following. First, I'll show you how to test for a company's solvency. Solvency means the ability of a company to survive in the long term. We'll then be looking at some very interesting stock market ratios, in particular return on equity, earnings per share, popularly goes by the acronym EPS, price earnings ratio, which goes by the acronym PE, you must have heard that, and payout ratio. These ratios tell you whether to expect the company's stock price to increase in the future and therefore helps you make a decision on whether to invest or not. So, let's start. What is Solvency ratio means or measures the ability of a company to survive over a long period of time. Hypothetically, can you have a company which looks profitable, which appears to have cash, but in the long term it goes under? Absolutely. That's why it's very important, in addition to profitability and liquidity, which we talked about in the last module, to also examine solvency. You don't want to invest in a company which gives you a lot of dividends today and then goes belly up tomorrow. You don't want that. That's why solvency is important. Solvency is determined by two ratios. They are, before I come to the ratios, there are two criteria which determine solvency. First, the ability of a company to pay interest as it becomes due. If a company cannot pay interest when it becomes due, creditors the chances are they'll call in the loan and demand immediate repayment. That will definitely jeopardize the company's survival. Similarly, solvency is also determined by the ability of a company to obtain additional funds in the future. two criteria influence solvency. If they can't pay interest or they default on their existing loans, the chances are they're not going to survive. If they don't have the ability to obtain additional funds, chances are they're not going to survive. The first one, ability to pay interest due, is measured by a ratio called times interest earned. The ability to obtain funds in the future is measured by a ratio called debt to total asset. This last ratio, 
debt to total asset measures the extent to which a company is already indebted. If the debt to total asset ratio is high, is it good or bad? It's bad. The chances of obtaining a loan to meet an emergency will be low and the company's survival will be threatened. So you want this ratio to be as low as possible. You want the times interest ratio to be as high as possible and you want the debt to total asset ratio to be as low as possible. Here are the four. Times interest ratio is profit before interest and tax over interest expense. Believe it or not, there is a cutoff. For times interest earn ratio, the cutoff is 5. Write this down. It's 5. Anything below 5 would be deemed unacceptable. So if, a, if, you, if your company applies for a loan and the loan officer computes the times interest earned from your income statement and he gets he or she gets a number less than five, the conclusion is you're going to have difficulty paying off your existing creditors so what chances do you have of paying them off if, if they give you a loan? So the chances of your company getting a loan would be very minimal. The higher the better. Five may be acceptable. Below five, unacceptable. And the higher the better. For debt to total asset, the cutoff is... 40%. 40% is deemed acceptable. The lower the better. Anything above 50% though is considered really bad. If, you, if a loan officer computes the debt to total assets ratio and it's above 50%, it means that creditors have a claim on more than 50% of your company. So who would give you a loan in that situation? Now, I would like you to compute the debt to total asset and times interest earn ratio for Jackville Company. It's parts L and M. So stop this recording now and have a crack at it. Once you're done, I'll give you the solutions. It's to your benefit to do it first before you look at the answers. So, stop now. Are you done? How do we figure out times interest and ratio? It's not as easy as it looks, right? It's profit before interest and tax. Okay, well the net income is 39000 but that's after deducting tax of eighteen and interest expense of 7200 So you have to add those back to get the profit before interest and tax. And you divide it by the interest expense of 7002 For Jackville Company, the times interest earned comes to around 8.9. What's your conclusion? Ideally, the higher the better. This is just above the cutoff point. So we can conclude that the company has the ability to pay off its debts, but only just. 
to get to total debt to total assets, how did you do it? You have to first add up the debt. Debt is money owed to outsiders. So in this case, the debt is accounts payable, 112, taxes payable, 23,000, and bonds payable, 130,000. That's it. That's it. When you look at the balance sheet, don't get confused. Stockholders' equity is not debt. Stockholders' equity is money that belongs to stockholders who are the owners of the company. So that doesn't count. They aren't outsiders. And you divide by total assets, 638. The percentage is 41.5%. This means creditors have a claim on 41 or 42% of the company and the owners have a claim on the rest, 58% of the company. For debt to asset ratio, the lower the better. This ratio is acceptable, but it's marginal. So the company may just about survive. So what were your conclusions now? They failed the liquidity, and in terms of solvency, they're marginal. Now, let's look at other ratios. I'm now focusing on ratios that are used by financial analysts to give advice on which companies to invest in the stock market. Ratios used by financial analysts for decision to invest in the stock market. These are the ratios you see in the Wall Street Journal. How many of you read the Wall Street Journal for bedtime reading? If you do, you'll see these ratios at the back. The ratios I'm focusing on now are Return on stockholders' equity, earnings per share, price earnings or PE ratio, and payout ratio. Those are the four important ratios which tell you is the stock price going to go up or is it going to go down. Let's take each of these one by one. Return on stockholders' equity. This measures profitability from the stockholders' viewpoint. This ratio shows how many dollars of net income were earned for each dollar invested by the owners. Let me repeat, how many dollars of net income were earned for each dollar invested by the owners? The formula is in front of you, net income divided by average stockholders equity. How do you know if it's good or bad? Ideally, over time, you want to see this ratio improving. That's one way. The second is you compare it with your competitors. And obviously, you want to have a higher return on stockholders' equity than your competitors. If you don't, guess what? Your stock price is going to go down. Because investors would say, well, I get a, hi a higher return from others, so let me buy their stock. So when the demand for your stock goes down, stock price goes down. Now I want you to do part H of Jackville Company, which asks you to compute the return on stockholders' equity. 
stop this presentation now, do the computations, and then check your answer. When you're ready, we'll restart. Are you ready? Here's the answer. The net income is 39000 To get average stockholders' equity, you add the beginning stockholders' equity. You get it on the balance sheet. The ending stockholders' equity, divide by 2. That's 350000 plus 373000 divide by 2 in the denominator. The answer is 10.7%. What does that mean exactly? 10.7%. This means that for every dollar invested by the owners, they get about 11 cents return. Every dollar that you as an investor invest, you get 11 cents return from the company. You want this high or low? Well, as high as possible. As I told you, the only way to know if this is good or bad is to compare trends. If it's increasing, that's positive. Do you have a good handle on this first ratio? If so, let's move on. Our next ratio is earnings per share. Earnings per share is a measure of the net income earned on each share of common stock. It's computed by dividing net income by the weighted average number of shares. Here's the formula in front of you. What does weighted average number mean? We'll come to that later. Let's start off with a simple example. Look at this problem in front of you. Company issued 100,000 of common stock. $5 par value, that means the price the company determined for each stock was $5. Its net income is 500000 What is the company's EPS, earnings per share? Stop this now, try this problem, and when you're done, we'll restart. Are you done? Let's restart. The net income is 500,000. The company issued 100,000 of common stock. The price determined was $5. So how many stock, the number, did they issue? They must have issued 100,000 divided by $5. That's 20,000 common stock. So you divide the profit, 500,000, by the number of shares, 20,000, and the earnings per share is $25. This means that on each share of common stock, the company made a profit or the company earned $25. EPS is very carefully monitored by stockbrokers. Generally, if EPS increases, it sends a very strong positive signal to the stock market. And if it decreases, it sends a negative signal. As I said, EPS is a very important ratio that's reported on the Wall Street Journal 
and followed closely by financial analysts. How was that? That wasn't too bad, was it? Okay, let's make it a little tougher. Try the second example. Here it is. Eyeball this information for a minute. A company had 24,000 of its common stock issued on January 1 in a hypothetical year, 2000X. On October 1, it issued 6,000 more common stock. The company's reported net income at the end of the year was $78,000. What? is its EPS. Would you like a few minutes to try this? If so, stop this presentation and have a crack at it. Are you done? Let's try it. If you look at the formula, it said the denominator was weighted number of shares. How do you calculate the weighted number? Okay. Follow me through this very carefully. From January 1 to September 30th, the company had 24,000 shares issued. That's for 9 months out of 12, it had 24,000 shares issued. On October 1, they issued 6,000 shares. So, from October 1 to December 31, that is the 3 months out of 12, they had a total of 30,000 shares issued. So, 9 months out of 12, 24,000 shares were out there. 3 months out of 12, 30,000 shares were out there. So, you times the number by the date. So to weight it, you multiply 24,000 by 9 over 12 and 30,000 by 3 over 12. As you can see, the total weighted number of shares is 25,500. When you divide it by the net income, you get $3.05 per share. That is the EPS. Now, I want you to spend a few minutes and compute EPS for Jackville Company, that is Part L. Stop this recording now and have a crack at it. Start again when you're done. Are you done? Let's have a look. 150,000 shares worth of shares were out there, $5 par value, that's 30,000 shares. Net income divided by number of shares out there, the net income was 39,000, the number of shares were 30,000, so its earnings per share is $1.30 per share. In this case, it was easy because you didn't have to wait then. Now, here are two final ratios that are very often used. They're also important ratios because each, in turn, gives you a feel for the company's strategy and investors' confidence in the company. The next ratio is the price earnings or P.E. ratio. The price earnings ratio is a much quoted measure of the ratio of the market price of each share of common stock to the earnings per share. The PE ratio 
reflects investors' assessments of a company's future earnings. I need to repeat that because it's very, very important. The P-E ratio reflects investors' assessment of a company's future earnings. So it really measures investors' confidence in a company. Repeat, the P-E ratio measures or surrogates for investors' confidence in a company. So, the higher the P-E, the greater the confidence investors have in a company that the company's earnings will go up. The formula is in front of you. Market price over earnings per share. Let's do an example. Here it comes. I'm giving you three companies, A, B, C. Company A has earnings per share of $20. The market price is $2. Company B, earnings per share of 40 The market price, $5. Company C, earnings per share $60 market price $12. In which company would you invest? Take your time. Stop this recording if you have to. I want you to think and tell me in which company do you think investors have greater confidence? To make life easy, assume all three are in the same industry. So let me repeat, in which company do investors have greater confidence? I think you had enough time to try it, or at least to think about it. So let's have a look. Let's do the P-E ratio first. For company A, it was 10. B, 40. I'm oh, sorry, 8. C, 5. It would appear, when you eyeball the data, C seem to be bigger and appear to be more attractive. But A has the highest PE of 10, B has the second highest of 8, and C is bottom with 5. How do you interpret this? Here we go. Company A. P ratio 10 means the market is willing to pay 10 times its earnings for each share. Company B, P ratio of 8, the market is willing to pay 8 times its earnings for each share. Company C, P ratio 5, the market is willing to pay five times its earnings for each share. So investors have greater confidence in A, even though it's smaller now. For the stock of some companies, investors are willing to pay over 20 times the current per share earnings. They feel the company's future growth in earnings will provide an adequate or superior return on the investment. Examples of companies with price earnings ratios of over 20 are Oracle 37, Microsoft 38, 
Coca-Cola 77, Gillette Company 38. Examples of companies with low price earnings ratios are Ford Motor Company 7, General Motors 8, United Airlines 5. It's pretty low. That means investors don't have too much confidence that their earnings will grow. Now, let's go to the payout ratio. The payout ratio measures the percentage of earnings distributed in the form of cash dividends. It's computed by dividing cash dividends by net income. So the payout is as follows. One more time. Measures the percentage of earnings distributed in the form of dividends. Here's the formula. Cash dividends by net income. Do you want the payout to be high or low? Take your time and think about it. Generally, if you see a very high payout ratio, that should send a warning signal that something's not quite right. You don't want to see too high a payout ratio. This means that not enough money is being plowed back into the business for future expansion. Generally though, <coughs> a low payout ratio isn't necessarily bad. This means that the company is putting back money into the business for expansion. That's why they are not paying out their profits as dividends. Believe this or not, some companies such as Toys R Us and Microsoft never, never paid a cash dividend in their first five years. So their payout ratio in the first five years was zero. Question, was that bad for investors? No. The companies expanded and investors' stock prices went up. So they didn't get it in the form of dividends, but they certainly got rewards in the form of increase in stock price. So they're not doing badly at all. So a high payout ratio is good if you're a speculator. It's not good if you're interested in capital appreciation. That is, you want to stick money in and wait for the stock price to increase. One note, dividends are paid out of retained earnings. Very important. If your retained earnings are zero, you can't pay dividends. Every year, the bottom line profit made by a company is added to retained earnings and dividends are pulled out of retained earnings. So, there's a formula. The retained earnings at the start of the year increases by the profit made by the company during the year. Then, it decreases by the dividends paid. So, beginning retained earnings plus profit less dividend give you the ending retained earnings. We have virtually completed this module. You should be able to figure out ratios and analyze the company from the point of view of profitability liquidity, solvency. Before completing this module, I want you to work parts J and K of Jackville Company. That is, the price, earnings, and payout ratio. Stop this CD-ROM and do it.
when you're done, open, start again, and I'll give you the solution. done? Here we go. Price earnings is market price over earnings per share. So we figured it out. 1950 divided by a dollar 30, around 15. Payout ratio is dividends paid over net income. Net income the denominator, 39,000, is easy, given to you. How do you find out dividends paid? It's not given to you in the problem, but you can find out by using the formula I gave you a few minutes ago. Remember, dividends are paid out of net income. So for your exam, this is the way you do it. 2004, what was the beginning retained earnings? 200,000. How much profit was made? 39. So in total, the retained earnings balance should have been 239. If no dividends were paid, the retained earnings at the end of the year should be 239. Look at the balance sheet. December 31, or the last day, 2004, what was the retained earnings? 223. That means 16,000 of dividends had been paid. Another way of doing it is beginning retained earnings, 200, plus profit, 39, less dividends, which is the plug number. Ending retained earnings is 223. So for you to have an ending of 223, 16,000 must have been paid. So you stick in 16,000 as the numerator of the payout ratio, you get 41%. What does 41% mean? It means that 41% of earnings were paid out as dividends. That's not too bad. 40% is acceptable. It's not, too, it's not considered too high, nor too low. We did a lot in this module, and we covered some very important sections. I hope you understood it. And that's the end of Module 10.